Welcome to our course. This is a totally new way of thinking about perimenopause and menopause. You're in the right place. If you have symptoms, maybe you're 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, if you have symptoms that are starting related to perimenopause or menopause, or if you just wanna see what's the big deal, how do I get prepared for it, how can I increase my awareness and my knowledge, you're in the right place too. You know, I went to Harvard Medical School, I went to MIT, I did my residency training at the University of California, San Francisco. But what really has helped me prepare for this course is being a female and struggling with some of the symptoms that many of us experience through perimenopause and menopause. And a lot of that starts in your 30s, sometimes as early as your early 20s. So we're gonna get into the details today. We're gonna talk about all the different issues that you might be facing in perimenopause and menopause. And I'm just so delighted that you're here. I wanna talk a little bit about my personal experience with perimenopause because I felt like nothing prepared me, nothing got me ready for this dramatic change that occurred. So I'm 55 now, I'm still cycling. The average age for menopause is about 51 to 52. And my symptoms began when I was about 35. So that's when my period started to get a little closer together. Instead of every 28 days, they were about every 25 days, 26, 24. I had a lot more premenstrual syndrome. I had this feeling of just being overwhelmed. I just couldn't cope with kind of what was coming down the pike at me in terms of life. I had one kid and I really struggled with motherhood. I remember driving home from working in the clinic, I'd work about a 10 hour day, and I would just sit in the driveway and just prepare myself, kind of brace myself, to walk into my home and to show up for my husband and my baby at that time. I just really, I felt like I was struggling and I didn't know why. I went to my doctor, I explained what was going on with my periods, with my stress levels. I was struggling also with weight at that point, and my doctor didn't offer me much. He suggested that I consider exercising more, eating less, and maybe take an antidepressant. And that did not feel right to me. That did not feel right. So that's what started me on the path of really looking at the hormones of perimenopause and menopause so that I could prepare myself better, but also help my patients, my patients that were struggling the way that I was struggling, and they weren't finding answers from their primary care physicians. So as I got a little deeper into perimenopause, as I turned 40 and then 45 and then 50, my symptoms started to shift. So my periods got even closer together every 22 days, every 21 days, but I also started to notice other changes. I had night sweats the week before my period. I had issues with my blood sugar and my doctor seemed totally unconcerned. I was concerned. I didn't like that my fasting glucose kept climbing every year. And then I would say after 50, that's when I started to have some memory issues. So I just couldn't remember things the way that I once used to be able to. I used to have a mind like a steel trap. I used to be able to you know, remember every single word in a sentence that I wanted to. And I realized I had to reach a little bit more. So if you're struggling with any of these symptoms, I just wanna reassure you that you are in the right place. We are gonna talk about the root causes of the symptoms. Why do they occur? Because when you really understand the mechanism, when you understand what's going on with you biologically, that allows you to really be set up for the kind of solutions that are gonna help you in a major way. Solutions that are sustainable, that are natural, that are really gonna work with your body to get you back into hormonal harmony. The good news is that you don't have to be a passive bystander to all of these changes that are coming down the pike for you. So whether you're 30 or 35, 40, 45, 50, or even older, you can be empowered to deal with some of these symptoms that you're struggling with and to really step into the role of citizen scientist so that you can figure out, okay, here's what's going on. Here's the root cause. Here's what I'm gonna do about it. I'm gonna be sharing with you a three-step Gottfried protocol where you use lifestyle tweaks, lifestyle redesign as a first part of the protocol. Second part is to use herbal allies 
Third part of the protocol is to use bioidentical hormones when they're needed to address your symptoms. This is a crash course on your hormones, the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone that's at the root of the symptoms that you're experiencing, but also the secondary hormones, things like cortisol, thyroid, insulin, how those can really affect the way that your brain functions, the way that your body functions, your weight on the bathroom scale, the amount of energy you have to face the day, the symptoms you might have related to sex drive or vaginal dryness. We're going to get into the details. You're going to learn the ecosystem. A central part of the story with perimenopause and menopause is the role of the female brain. The brain goes through an energy crisis. This begins right around age 40. So you may have noticed this. It could be that you walk into a room and you can't remember why. You can't remember that word on the tip of your tongue. You keep losing your phone or your keys. This is the female brain in crisis. The female brain and the way it utilizes glucose changes. Up until premenopause, through say age 35, most of us are using glucose almost exclusively as a fuel for the brain. But what happens around 40 is that the female brain starts to shift. The mitochondria, the powerhouses inside of your cells can no longer use glucose the way that it once did. So the result is kind of this slowdown, this low brain energy state. And when I describe that to patients in my office, they get it. They're like, oh my gosh, Dr. G, I totally have that. What do I do? I've been taking care of women through perimenopause and menopause for about 30 years. And what I find time and again is that women really struggle with symptoms. They haven't had a lot of information or education about what to expect as they turn 35 and older and start to experience some of the symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. And so that's what we're gonna do with this course. We're really gonna increase your awareness, your understanding, your knowledge base, so that you can face your symptoms, you can face the root cause of your symptoms, and you have a long list of solutions that are sustainable, that are really effective and evidence-based so that you can feel your best through the transition of perimenopause and menopause. What I find talking to women is that there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of myths out there about what you're up against in perimenopause and menopause. One of the things I thought myself when I was in my 20s and 30s was that menopause was a, a cliff I'd fall off of around age 50, and I didn't really have to worry about it until then. But the truth is, your hormones start to change, sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes in dramatic ways, beginning much earlier. So that can be in your late 20s, especially with testosterone and DHEA. It can be around 35 to 40 as you begin to run out of ripe eggs with progesterone declining. And then in your 40s, you might notice that your estrogen begins to decline. So those are some of the changes that occur much sooner than the average age of menopause. In fact, a lot of us go through perimenopausal symptoms for 10 years, in my case, 20 years before the onset of menopause. There's other people who are really well prepared, super aware about the changes that are occurring. They're on top of their hormones and they often struggle with symptoms for a much shorter duration, maybe just a few months. And what we want is for you to have choice to really have a lot of awareness and knowledge about how to deal with these symptoms that you're experiencing so that you can have the best transition ever. Another thing I hear from my patients is that they go to their doctor with symptoms of perimenopause. Maybe it's, I can't sleep anymore, or I'm a total bitch at home. I just am yelling at my children. I don't know why I feel so irritable. I'm more moody or I don't have energy like I used to, or I'm so hot all the time, I'm having these hot flashes, power surges, I've got night sweats, I've lost my sense of humor, I've lost my sex drive, it is missing in action, I don't even know if I wanna find it. So they take those symptoms to their doctor, and often their doctor is not very helpful. Their doctor says something like, you're getting older, you're 42, you're 45, you're just getting older. This is how it is. Accept it, get used to it. And I just wanna say, no, that's not right. It's not accurate. 
there's so much that you can do so that this time really supports you. And it does what I think it's meant to do, which is to help us transition from kind of those householder years that we have through our 20s and 30s. You know, some of us are working on career, some of us are working on family, some of us are doing all of the above. It's a time to shift from especially 40 to 65, to shift from that householder role to more of a role of connecting to your purpose, connecting to your mission. It's almost an initiation. I think of perimenopause and menopause as an initiation, a time to step back from dominant culture and to really understand, am I living life on my own terms? Am I still controlled by my mother's script or my father's script? Or am I living my life in a way that is completely aligned with what it is that I want? So perimenopause is known as, you know, the period of time around menopause. So it can last a few months, it can last a few decades, depending on how attuned you are to the symptoms. But what's happening behind the scenes is that your ovaries, if you still have them, are producing less and less of the sex hormones, progesterone first and then estrogen, and then for some of us, testosterone. So you're producing less sex hormones, and once you drop below a certain threshold, that's when symptoms can begin. Those can be physical symptoms. It could be breast tenderness. It could be that fibroids are growing in your uterus. You've got heavier bleeding. It can also be emotional symptoms, more irritability, more premenstrual syndrome, more premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So there's a lot of different symptoms that can result from perimenopause, and they can also vary woman to woman. Menopause is when you go a full year without a period. So really, menopause is just one day. It's when you have your one-year anniversary, and hopefully you throw yourself a menopause party. So menopause is really a biological construct, a year without a period, or if you've had, say, a hysterectomy, it's when you go a, a, with a, an FSH, a follicle-stimulating hormone level, that's greater than 25 or 35. So menopause is a biological construct, but it's, it's also a sociocultural construct. And I think this is super important because I remember when my mother was going through menopause, and she said to me, Sarah, I feel like I'm disappearing. I feel like there's so much emphasis, you know, when I read Vogue magazine or when I'm online, when I'm watching TV shows, there's so much emphasis on a youth culture. And once you hit menopause, you just start to disappear. You're, it's like you're on the sidelines. You're more dismissed. And I was so sad to hear that from her. And I made a vow at that time to just say, whoa, stop, can't do that, hold up. We need to really value women as they're going through this experience of perimenopause and menopause. We need to support women so that we can take care of ourselves in a whole new way. We need to tend and befriend each other so that we can activate oxytocin, get that together with estrogen so that you really feel bonded and connected and loved and supported. When I was living in Alaska, getting ready to go off to Harvard Medical School. In Alaska, they used to have the saying that if you go to Harvard, you have to overcome it to come back into the state. So I was thinking about that. But I was also thinking about one of my mentors, Christiane Northrup. And Christiane Northrup, who wrote Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom, said something really valuable to me. She said that when you're in your reproductive years, so that's, you know, from puberty until you stop cycling regularly around 35, 40, 45. When you're in your reproductive years, you have a different level of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone every single day of your cycle. Those different levels of hormones in some ways force you to be accommodating, force you to kind of roll with the punches and sort of put up with all the things that are coming your way. It kind of works with uh, those of us with a trauma history and we're people pleasers. So we accommodate, accommodate, accommodate. Then when you hit perimenopause and you no longer have this kind of predictable level of hormones each day, 
the hormonal veil comes off and you start to speak your truth for the first time. And that's what I get really excited about with perimenopause and menopause because it allows us to step into our power and to really make choices about how we want to live our lives, to look at things like people-pleasing, to see how some of these behaviors either are serving us or no longer serve us. So the more that we can step into our power, understand what's going on with our bodies, that allows us to really have the wind at our back. I think of these hormones as really supporting us in speaking our truth, getting radically honest, and going through this initiation process. What is perimenopause? What is menopause? I think it's really important to understand that estrogen is the primary starring role of the transition that women experience through middle life. So estrogen is a primary regulator of the female body. It does a lot of different things at different life stages. So it's pretty low when you're first born. You get a little estrogen from your mother. But when you hit puberty, that's when your estrogen levels start to fluctuate quite a bit. And so that's when a lot of women will notice the acne, the breakouts, they have breast development, they've got development of their uterus, they get their menstrual period. So puberty is a huge change in terms of the female body. Then there's this relatively stable period of time during your reproductive years. So that's usually during your 20s and 30s, sometimes into your 40s. And then perimenopause hits. Perimenopause is kind of like puberty in reverse, where initially progesterone starts to decline and estrogen fluctuates wildly. And then in the second phase, estrogen declines. And then in menopause, you're in a state where estrogen, progesterone are low, and you may or may not also have low testosterone. So the definition of perimenopause is that it's the period of time around menopause. So it's typically about the 10 years from, say, 42 to 52, somewhere in there, where you notice some subtle changes, usually first with your menstrual cycle, but then you can broaden it to include emotional symptoms like irritability, mood swings. You can have more depression. You may notice hot flashes and night sweats. You may notice bladder infections, decreased sex drive. You may notice that your joints are not quite as lubricated as they used to be. You might have frozen shoulder or you're stiff in the hips. All of these things are related to the changes in estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Menopause is when you go one year without a period. So full stop, one year, it's just one day in your life. Menopause is that one year point of no bleeding. After that is postmenopause. So how do you know if you're in perimenopause? I have a lot of women who are in that 35 to 45 year age group and they're just like, I don't know, is this depression or is it perimenopause? How do you tell the difference? So I wanna go through some of the questions that I have in my book, The Hormone Cure. So perimenopause, how do you know you're in it? Well, one thing is that, say over the last six months, you may have noticed that some of your householder responsibilities, like going to the grocery store or your chores at home, cleaning up around the house, you're just a lot less enthusiastic about it. In fact, um, it's really the last thing on your mind. You may notice that you want to be more socially isolated. You may notice, for instance, that when you go to a party, you can't wait to leave. When you have plans, you might be thinking, I really hope they cancel. That is perimenopause, very common. A lot of women notice that their pants don't fit the same way. They can't button their pants. They've got more belly fat than they used to because one of the changes happening behind the scenes is the way that estrogen is talking to insulin. So the distribution of fat, which starts to deposit fat at puberty, right at the breast and at the hips, that starts to reverse. And so instead, you get more fat deposited at the waist. So this is not just an issue of not fitting into your pants. It actually represents a metabolic crisis for many of us. So unless you're not on top of it, unless you're 
not, you know, checking your labs and staying on top of things like your fasting glucose and your hemoglobin A1C levels and what's happening when you eat carbohydrates. This can lead to some weight gain and some fat gain, especially after the age of 40. A lot of women describe to me emotional instability. They just find that they are crying at work, they are yelling at their kids, and they just feel like their emotions are much more amplified than what they were 10 or 15 years ago. Many women describe to me that they are just sick of exercising. They feel like it does nothing anyway, so why bother with exercise? They're too tired anyway to do it. So your fondness for exercise might change as a result of perimenopause. You might notice difficulty sleeping. So in the first phase of perimenopause, when your ovaries are making less progesterone, what you may notice is that you don't sleep all the way through the night the way that you once did. You may notice more anxiety. You may feel like those periods are getting closer together and closer together. All of these are low progesterone symptoms, and that is the first half of perimenopause. Second half is low estrogen, but it's, it's valuable to kind of separate these symptoms so you know the root cause. You may be waking up sweaty in the middle of the night. You may be feeling like, oh my gosh, I have to change my sheets again. I have to change my nightgown. Maybe I need to change my partner. Very common in perimenopause. You may notice more wrinkles. So estrogen, one of its jobs is to kind of gird the skin of your face to keep you from getting wrinkly. So you may notice more wrinkles here and here. And you know, that's, that's part of the decline in estrogen. You might notice that you are less interested in grooming. So it's, it's so fun for me because I'm going through perimenopause at the same time that my daughters are well into puberty. And I can tell you my 17 year old cares so much about what she looks like when she walks out the door. So she's like impeccably groomed, her makeup is perfect, her hair is flawless. And then I'm in the kitchen working at the table wondering, when did I last wash my hair? I'm not really sure. So that interest in grooming habits comes from the increase in estrogen together with the connection to oxytocin. It makes you care about your girlfriends when you're uh, a teenager. It makes you care about how you look. Uh, it makes you care about attractiveness. And then you kind of get the reverse once you hit 40. So your menstrual cycle might become totally unpredictable. You may not know if when it's gonna come, if it's gonna be heavy or light, if it's gonna be spotting or flooding or somewhere in between. Very common in perimenopause. You may notice that you care more about chocolate or alcohol than you do about sex. So that's very common for, for us who are going through perimenopause and menopause and uh, you know, there are some folks who just feel like, why do I want to keep doing this? Like, maybe the shop is closed. So sex drive is about 70% hormonal, and definitely the hormonal changes to perimenopause and menopause can make your libido take a hit. The other thing that I see women do as they go through perimenopause and menopause is that they, they feel like some of the lifestyle changes that they need to do to survive perimenopause and menopause, to thrive through perimenopause and menopause, things like stop eating sugar, no more packaged foods, no more processed foods, exercise more, lift heavy weights, do some meditation every single morning. They feel like that sounds totally overwhelming. I just can't even imagine fitting that into my life. That is a symptom of perimenopause. So I just wanna tell you that if you're feeling less gung-ho about behavior change, that is part of the symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. And the good news is we've got your back. We've got solutions that are gonna be palatable that you can start to make in you know, small ways because we know that these baby steps that you take, some of the solutions that we're talking about in the course, when you take these baby steps and you start to aggregate them, over time, they add up to major transformation. And that's what I want for you as you make your way through perimenopause and menopause. We've talked about estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone and how they're really the central story of perimenopause. But I think it's important to realize that hormones don't exist in a vacuum. 
So there's really this whole orchestra of your hormonal system. And there's three hormones in particular that I think are important to pay attention to. So estrogen, cortisol, and thyroid. We've talked about estrogen already. It's the primary regulator of the female body. It's in relationship with progesterone. I think of them as tango partners. So you want them to be in really good balance where one doesn't dominate over the other. So you want balance between estrogen and progesterone, but estrogen also crosstalks with thyroid hormone. Thyroid determines the speed of your metabolism. It's like your gas pedal and it, it decides how fast or slow you burn calories. It's involved in inside your cells with how fast you're making biochemical products. Cortisol is so essential. It's really the most essential hormone out of all the ones that we're talking about. In fact, I had someone on a podcast say, oh, it's like Michael Cortisol Leone. Cortisol is kind of like the, the highest priority because you can live without estrogen. You can live without progesterone, testosterone, but you really need cortisol, you need thyroid too, but you definitely need cortisol. It's involved in so many different things. It controls your blood sugar. It's involved in your ability to have a stress response, fight, flight, freeze. It's also involved in your response to uh, your immune system's response. It modulates the immune system. So these three hormones, estrogen, cortisol, thyroid, they all crosstalk and you want them working on your side. You want them supporting you. So yes, we're gonna pay a lot of attention to estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, but I want you to realize that there's this larger orchestra that includes estrogen, thyroid, and cortisol and the way that they work together. So we've defined perimenopause. You've got a sense of some of the hormonal changes that are underpinning the symptoms that you might be experiencing. And I want you to pay attention to these triads. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, but also estrogen, cortisol, and thyroid. So we wanna be thinking about how they're working together and when they're not working together, how that's gonna trigger symptoms for you. Let's talk about some of the hormonal changes that occur during perimenopause and menopause. So I wanna show you a figure. There's a really helpful illustration that we're sharing with you that shows the symptoms as a function of time. And what I'd like for you to do is to, to see between the age 50 and age 55, there's a dotted line that says last period. So we know the average age for menopause in the United States is around 51 to 52. And if you take that dotted line and bring it up to the top of the figure, what you'll see is the symptoms to the left that are associated with perimenopause. That includes weight gain, fibroids, more cramping, breast tenderness, irritability, more hunger, insomnia, vaginal dryness, loss of libido. And then there are the symptoms that tend to happen towards the end of perimenopause and into menopause. And that includes hot flashes, night sweats, breast cancer, depression, heart disease, more vaginal discomfort, osteoporosis, incontinence. What I want you to notice is that a lot of these symptoms, especially the mood swings, hot flashes, night sweats, low libido, insomnia, these are coming from the brain, coming from the brain. So a lot of us are thinking perimenopause and menopause, it's all about my ovaries. No, what's happening is that there are changes occurring in the female brain and they're driving a lot of your symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. In functional medicine, we use a systems biology approach. And I think it's valuable to spend a moment, quick science moment, on the systems biology of what's happening in perimenopause and menopause. So the systems biology of your body in premenopause is working pretty well. For those of us who have regular periods every 28 to 30 days, You've got you know, these changes in your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone each day. Testosterone tends to peak around day 14. Estrogen peaks around day 12. Progesterone peaks around day 21 or 22. So these are kind of the normal cycle of your hormones. And then the control system stops working so well. 
In a systems approach to hormones, you really want to start at the top, which is the female brain. The parts of the brain that control your hormones are called the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So these two parts of your brain are involved in controlling your levels of hormones. And what happens is that once you start to run out of ripe eggs in your ovaries, the message, the feedback loop between your brain and your ovaries starts to falter. So it doesn't work the way that it once did. You can think of the hypothalamus and the pituitary as kind of the boss of your endocrine organs and the rest of your body. So certainly your ovaries, but also your thyroid gland, also your adrenal glands, which are the place where you make most of your sex hormones, including cortisol, pregnenolone, DHEA. So the control system starts to get wonky, typically sometime between 35 and 45. The other thing that you want to keep in mind is that if you're someone who's experienced a fair amount of trauma, either as a child or as an adult, that can really disrupt your stress response system and it can disrupt the control system for your hormones. So what I see time and time again is women who've experienced significant trauma. Maybe they've got an elevated ACE score, adverse childhood experiences, and they have a rockier time going through perimenopause and menopause. So we want to be thinking about those triads, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. We also want to be thinking about the crosstalk between estrogen, cortisol, and thyroid, and how the control system can sometimes be jacked up before you even enter perimenopause. And if it is, it can make the process, the transition, even rockier. A lot of women wonder if they can do some testing, blood testing to see where they are. And the answer is yes. And if you get told by your clinician that you can't tell that hormones fluctuate too much and it's not worth measuring them, I would recommend that you find a more collaborative clinician to work with. So hormone tests really give you a lot of information through perimenopause and menopause. What we know is that in the first phase of perimenopause, when progesterone starts to drop, if you're still cycling, you can measure your progesterone usually on day 21 or 22 and see if it's 10 or higher. If it's less than that, it means that you're starting to run out of progesterone. Your progesterone levels are low. And it gives you symptoms like uh, shorter time in between your periods, it can make you feel more anxious, and it can disrupt your sleep. So that's the first phase. You can measure progesterone to assess that. Once estrogen starts to decline in the second half of perimenopause, that's where you find that your estradiol levels are not quite what they used to be. So they used to peak around day 12 of your menstrual cycle. Now it might be 20 or less. So you can measure estradiol as a way of checking to see if you're in phase one or phase two of perimenopause. The way that we deal with hormone therapy in terms of women going through these different phases of perimenopause is that typically we just treat with what's missing. So in the first half of perimenopause, when progesterone is low, that's where we wanna give a prescription for natural progesterone, especially in women who are struggling with sleep because we know from randomized trials that it improves your sleep. In the second half of perimenopause, when progesterone is low and then estrogen is low, you wanna treat both of those in people who are a good candidate. And then you can use blood testing. You can do some additional testing too, such as with dried urine. You can check cortisol with saliva, but you can use blood testing to assess where you are and then also to monitor therapy. So if you're starting to notice that this is a lot of information, don't worry, that's a symptom of perimenopause. One of the things I recommend is that you take my questionnaires. So we've got a number of questionnaires in the course that you can use to identify which of your hormones are out of balance, and that can then allow you to use the Gottfried protocol to address that specific hormone imbalance. One of the most common questions I get is, what about hormone therapy? What could I take during perimenopause versus menopause? So if you're feeling somewhat overwhelmed about all the things that we've covered right now, I just wanna let you know that we're gonna go over this multiple times. So you may hear it once here, and then you're gonna hear it again in the future. We're gonna make sure that you understand this. 
So in the first half of perimenopause, when progesterone is low, maybe your periods are closer together, you're having trouble with sleep, you're struggling with anxiety, that's when I like to give progesterone. So progesterone on its own. I don't do that in menopause. I only do that in perimenopause, the first half of perimenopause. If I have someone who's got low estrogen symptoms, maybe they've got some memory issues, they've got vaginal dryness, they're noticing that their mood is not quite what it used to be, that's when I add estrogen together with progesterone. So that's the second half of perimenopause, and that continues into menopause. So estrogen plus progesterone in the second half of perimenopause, continuing into menopause. Another question I get is, why are we gaining weight and what can we do about it? So there is this metabolic crisis that happens after age 40. For me, it started around age 35. I just could not lose weight no matter what I tried. And there is this entire change that's occurring below the hood where you can see that the way that estrogen and insulin are talking to each other begins to change. So estrogen is not what it used to be. You don't have the same levels that you once did. You have less progesterone, less soothing. You're not sleeping as well. That then jacks up cortisol the next day if you don't sleep well. And it leads to this redistribution of fat in your body so that you have less fat getting deposited at your breasts and your hips, more at your belly. There's also this change that occurs related to insulin and estrogen where after age 40, you gain about five pounds of fat and lose about five pounds of muscle every 10 years, decade after decade. So unless you're doing something specific about it to address your insulin, to measure your insulin and make sure that you're in a good metabolic uh, state with metabolic flexibility, able to burn carbs as well as ketones, metabolically healthy with a normal fasting glucose, a normal hemoglobin A1C, optimal range for your blood testing. Unless you're doing something really specific about it, you may notice that you're gaining weight through this process. So the more that you can pay attention to your food, the way that that is helping to feed your hormones and also keeping your insulin in check, that's gonna really help you prevent the weight gain that can occur for a lot of us as we go through the transition. This is the end of part one. You might be feeling like, wow, that's a lot of information. It's a lot of detail. Quick reminder that we're gonna get into all of the details as we get further in the course so that this really makes sense to you and you understand step-by-step step what solutions to put in place.